So um, let's pray, and then we'll get into a prophecy update. Heavenly Father, first of all, uh, we're very glad to be able to gather. We're very glad to be able to uh, put our minds to these kinds of things and think about these things. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I can't imagine what it would be like, Lord, to see all the things that are happening uh, around the country, in the world, uh, and not have the mind of Christ. Uh, so I just, I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Don't want to take that for granted. And, and I pray tonight, Lord, uh, that the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about and, and point out, I, I hope, Lord, that it will uh, bring some coherency to everything. And, and I do hope, Lord, that it be more than just uh, information, uh, but I do hope, Lord, that it edifies the body uh, as we look to Scripture, too, and to put these things together. Uh, obviously, Lord, uh, when we look at things getting worse and we see that you predicted them, it's supposed to let us know that your, your, your return is soon. And so I hope that that's loud and clear tonight and then uh, make a great transition into um, communion, your, de- your exodus, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So, um, yeah, I just thought it'd be good, a good time to kind of point out just a couple of things that are significant that, um, that I think are important for the church here. Uh, this last week, let's see, this is May 4th, right? So this last week, April 25th, uh, was the 102nd anniversary of a very significant event in the history of Israel, uh, and that is the San Remo Conference. So in 1920, Um, It was Britain, France, Italy, and Japan met together in San Remo, Italy there to actually codify and put into law the idea that Israel has a right to be a nation and has a right to the land. Uh, Now, there was the Balfour Declaration that was in 1917. That was just a declaration out out of Great Britain. The San Remo Conference put more strength to it and way to it, and quite honestly, at that conference, they were actually proposing almost all of Jordan to be given to Israel. And then finally, a few years later, in 1922, um, it was the 52 members of the League of Nations that actually made it into international law. So it was international law um, off of that San Remo conference that gives Israel the right to have that land. Uh, And then, of course, what ends up happening? Over the years, that land and that law keeps getting whittled away. They get less and less land, don't they? That's always the way it is. Um, And by the way, UN votes are not international law. They're not law. Uh, They try to, you know, say that to everybody and and make everybody think that they're creating it. It's not. It's not international law. So they have no no bearing and no weight. Um, But we have had a few... Uh, major events recently that have kind of moved humanity or human history forward by leaps and bounds. Uh, There there are some major events that should take uh, a short period of time and it takes a long period of time. There are other events that should take a very long period of time and it happens very quickly. So the last couple of years uh, we've had some tremendous changes throughout the world in human history that have supposedly taken, should have taken you know, 20, 30 years, but just rapidly, just like that. Uh, one is uh, COVID, right? Lots of changes uh, around the world. And the second thing that has happened you know, recently is Russia and Ukraine. So let's talk about Russia and Ukraine. It's all over the news almost every day. Um, in almost every news outlet, in every uh, platform that you can find news. And I would just say this. You're hearing that, um, you know, Russia's at fault, or maybe you're hearing some stories about Ukraine, and and this and that. Let me just say, everybody's dirty. The United States is dirty. The European Union is dirty. Russia's dirty. And even the political leaders in Ukraine So they try to point out the good guy and the bad guy. From heaven's perspective, and what I've been able to ascertain, everybody's got uh, dirt on their hands uh, for one reason or another, Um, even even China. Um, And so, you know, here everybody's talking about Russia and Ukraine, 
and whether or not they have a right to be a sovereign nation, but, but who ends up suffering? It's, it's the people, right? It, it's the people who, who Pat is helping or the Billings is helping. Those are the people who are caught in the middle of this thing, and quite honestly, even with the, you know, the embargoes and everything and the, and the tariffs that are happening to Russia, it's the Russians who are suffering too. It's you who are suffering because of the added you know, increase in, in the gas costs and the inflation and everything, right? So it, it's us, you know, serfs, <laughs> if you will, as, uh, as all these people are trying to play political games. And, and I would say this, I have a friend who was our guide in Israel, his name is Roman. He, he's not a Roman, he, he's a Russian, he's Jewish, Many of his family uh, were destroyed, you know, o- older family were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, and so I, I started to text him and I said, hey Roman, I'd love to get your take on this Russia-Ukrainian thing. And uh, he wrote back and he says, quite honestly, Scott, he says, I can't, even, I can't even talk about it. He says, I have friends and loved ones that are Russian and I have friends and loved ones in Ukraine. He says, so I, I, I really, I can't even talk about it because it's so painful. Um, but he did say this, he did say that the, the politics in Israel are about ready to blow up. I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, you've probably heard uh, recently that uh, every so often um, Putin uh, is talking about nuclear threat. You know, if you do this, we will obliterate you. And if you do that, we are going to fire off a nuke. And by the way, you've probably also heard that they develop some new hypersonic missile, and they have to some degree, but make no mistake, uh, every nuke that is around the world is hypersonic. Is that understood? Uh, a US sub, t- take a, a boomer, a ballistic missile sub, has 24 missiles. Each missile has five warheads for separate targets. Uh, that turns out to be a 120 warheads. So if you have a typical intercontinental ballistic missile, it it targets and goes in an arc like that. Okay, you may be able to have a defense system that can kind of, you know, figure out the destination and get a couple of those, but you're not gonna get all of them. Uh, Mankind has gotten so smart, he knows how to destroy all of us at least 30 times. (laughs) So the hypersonic missile that Russia has is a little bit different because It doesn't just follow one path, it can move like that, okay? But again, they're all hypersonic. Um, So take a look at this uh, first slide here. Not that slide, that slide. So this is from the Times in UK. In a Sunday evening primetime show, the Channel One anchor Dmitry Kislyov said, a strike by Russia's Poseidon nuclear underwater drone could turn Britain into a wasteland by drowning the country in a 500 meter tidal wave of radioactive s- seawater. <laughs> and that was in response to something Boris, uh, John, you know, the, the Prime Minister of England said. He just said, you know what, we have to stop Putin. Uh, next slide. And this supposedly is a picture of their underwater drone submarine that has nukes on it. I don't know, I don't know, this is the, it could be their propaganda. Russia has a history of showing propaganda. It could be just saber rattling between these nations. Um, For me, I've wondered why all these heads of states have been able to publicize and freely go to Kiev at, at, at the front line. Doesn't that seem odd to you? That does seem odd. No general goes to the front line like that. And certainly heads of state don't announce, hey, we're going to Kiev. If really, uh, we have this big war going. So something, something's not right there with all of these heads of states. Um, a little bit strange. So uh, whenever we talk about Russia and being in this place, uh, whenever Russia moves, people ask the question, is this the Gog-Magog war? Is this Ezekiel 38? Why don't, you, why don't you turn to Ezekiel 38? Ezekiel 38. 
But people ask that uh, because of Russia and because anthropologists since forever have always read about Russia in Ezekiel 38. Um, Take a look at verse one. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. So when you see Rosh, uh, that's a proper name. That's, that's to be known as Russia. Uh, the prince of Rosh, whoever the prince is, um, it, it's the leader, whoever the leader is. I'm not saying that, that Putin is the leader, <laughs> okay? We just don't know that. In fact, I think he's going in for cancer surgery. Who knows what the next guy's gonna be like? He may mo- be more you know, ruthless. Um, but set your face against Gog in the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, in Ezekiel's time, anthropologists tell us that there were uh, people groups called uh, the Rus or the Russo or the Rusafu. And so uh, we've known for the longest time that is a direct reference to Russians. Uh, Magog also is Russia. We just understand that. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Charles Ryrie. Charles Ryrie was a fantastic uh, pastor, um, theologian, I guess you could call him, Bible scholar, ri- has a study Bible, written a lot of commentaries. I, I, have, I have a good book that I, I was able to meet him one time in Dallas and had him autograph one of my books here. Um, he wrote incredible things for the church uh, concerning you know, the end times, uh, tribulation, rapture, et cetera, millennium. Uh, But he said this, he says, um, Magog is Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. And it's interesting because two months ago, Russia went into Kazakhstan and put down an uprising to keep Kazakhstan in place. It's just interesting. I don't don't know if he's right, but it is fascinating to know that these are the areas that keep coming up in the news. Uh, Now, uh, take a look at, uh, let's see, where do we leave off? Look at verse three, and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I will, by the way, these other names that are here that come up, a lot of it is in Turkey. And that's why right now, if you can pay attention to Turkey, Turkey's really important in this. Turkey, Turkey, interestingly enough, is in a very precarious situation because Ukraine is just to the west of them and they are their closest local ally. And yet Russia, to the north, has over like 22, 25% of their population takes vacation in Turkey. And because Russia supplies so much gas and oil to Turkey, uh, they don't wanna make Russia mad but they feel as though these are our best friends over here in Ukraine. So Turkey is really in an interesting position. And uh, Ezekiel prophesies that in the last days here, at this point in time, there's going to be some alliance between Russia, Turkey, and then we get to verse five, some other nations here. Um, I will turn you around, I will put hooks in your jaws, and again, that's a, that's an illustration of, of what the ancient military would do when they would take people hostage. For instance, when, when Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar came in and overturned Israel, when they took people away, they literally would put a hook in the jaw and they would chain them and they would deport them out of the country and bring them back to Babylon. So God is saying, I'm gonna put hooks in your jaw, Rosh, and I'm gonna draw you in to this mess. So I'll turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers, shields, all of them handling swords. And look at this, Persia, which by now, church, you should know is what? Is Iran. Persia is Iran. Ethiopia, which Ethiopia today is not the Ethiopia then. Ethiopia now is pretty much a Christian nation you know, in a marginal sense, uh, but this is more like Sudan and or Eritrea. And of course, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and, and helmet. So Persia 
and Iran will join this, and you can see that today, how there's a strong alliance between Russia and Iran, right? Um, it, it's no coincidence that Russia has bases and military in Syria. It's no coincidence that Turkey has bases and military in Syria with Russia. Um, it, it was funny because <laughs> uh, I was texting Roman and um, years ago when, when Roman, first time he guided with us, we would take him up to the Golan Heights and we're looking over into Syria and I was telling him, I said, you know, one day Ezekiel says that Russia's gonna be right there. He laughed, he goes, ha, 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 that's never gonna happen. <laughs> then a couple years later, he's writing me, he's like, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> so and he, he remembered that time frame. Um, um, so, it, so the question is, is what's happening today, right now, is that this in Ezekiel? And I would say no, it's not it. So I don't know what other guys are saying. I don't know if they're, try, if they're not being careful with their words, but I would say no, this is not the Gog Magog invasion uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I can remember when I served in the Cold War, uh, that was right after the Civil War, uh, <laughs> but when I served in the, in the Cold War, uh, Russia was the USSR and they had been down in that region before, and then they left. So, I mean, who knows? Here they are again. Who knows if they're gonna retreat? I, I just don't know. Um, but, but I can't say that because they're there right now, well, this is it, this is Gog Magog uh, invasion. And the other reason is because this happens after the rapture. This happens uh, during the first part of the tribulation, uh, that's why. Um, what's, what's the condition for this to happen? Well, chapter 37, I don't know if you have a title over that chapter, it says the dry bones live. And that was a prophecy concerning the supernatural resurrection or rebirth, if you will, of the nation of Israel. And before 1920, quite honestly, before the San Remo Conference, Thought, everybody thought this was not, no way, that doesn't say that, except Bible scholars did. People who read the Bible says, nope, it says it right here. Ezekiel says, what are these dry bones? And the Lord says, you know, it's Israel. They were dead. They're gonna be alive again. So the regathering or the reconstitution of the nation of Israel was a precondition. Well, that happened in 1948. So that's there. What's another condition for this to take place? Uh, look at verse 11. And, and this, is, this is another reason why I, I, I don't believe this is the Gog Magog invasion. Verse 11. Well, let me read verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that the thoughts will arise in your mind. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Rosh, the prince of Rosh. He says, the thoughts will come in your mind and you will make an evil plan and you will say... I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. So this alliance that seeks to go and you know, invade Israel and destroy, and by the way, it's an attempt. They won't do it. God intervenes supernaturally. There's not a single shot fired, but God intervenes supernaturally here. Uh, but they, they are going to go to them when Israel is at rest and they dwell safely, and I think that's a big key. So the question is, when does Israel dwell safely? When are they at rest? And I can only think of really two times. In the millennium, for sure, right? In the millennium, they'll dwell at rest. The other time is in that first half of the tribulation, because the beginning of the tribulation is when the Antichrist makes a peace treaty to say, I will give you protection. And so that first half of the tribulation is when they dwell safely, and they have guarantees. But, but we see what's gonna happen is he's going to break that treaty, he's gonna break that promise. And Jesus talks about it a little bit in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, if, if the rapture happened today, I still think it would take some time, or years, if you will, for 
you know, this thing to come together and actually go down there and, and do what they want to do. So I don't think it's now, right now. Um, is, it, is it stage setting? Surely. You know, we're always kind of, as far as God's concerned, always kind of moving forward toward that date when that takes place. But it's stage setting. That's it. Um, next slide. Let's talk about Israel and Russia's relations. This is from timesofisrael.com. It's, it's a website that I go to. I get some news from it. I also go to allisrael.com. That's uh, Joel Osteen. No. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, not Joel Osteen. Joel Rosenberg. Um, uh, so Israel doc, uh, allisrael.com and Times of Israel. Dot com is a, is a couple of really good sites, but this is interesting because the prime minister of Ukraine, uh, Zelensky, he's Jewish, right? And he was calling for Israel to be the place where they would hold peace talks. Well, that was really interesting. If Russia would go there with Israel and have these peace talks. That's fascinating. Um, and so relations were kind of heading in the right direction. Well, this is um, the foreign minister, Lavrov of Russia. He was in Italy in an interview, and um, he said this. He said, the worst anti-Semites are Jews. He was taking a shot at Zelensky, but he didn't realize he just infuriated 14 million people around the world. So the prime minister of Israel blew his stack. <laughs> and so uh, you can read headlines in, in Israel on heretz.com or um, jpost.com of what they said. They are, they've been infuriated now. And so the relations between Russia and Israel right now, they're completely deteriorated. They're just, they're just gone. Uh, and he went on to say, he says, I believe Hitler had Jewish blood. So this, this conflict between Russia and Israel uh, somehow is gonna have to get resolved so that they can dwell safely. And obviously that will be the man, that will be the Antichrist who will come and they're gonna have to kiss and make up for a while. <laughs> so that Israel, okay, there's no threat now from Russia and they'll be at peace for three and a half years. Um, so it, it, it's fascinating to watch that relationship now uh, at one point they talked about let's have our talks there and now it's, it's uh, blown to smithereens. So now there's threats going back and forth. So that's enough of Russia and Ukraine. I, I really want to get to this part because I really want to get to what this thing is really all about. Because it's not really about Russia. It's not about Ukraine. It's not about Russia being threatened with NATO um, they can say all they want, but it's really about something else that they've longed to do and longed to achieve, and the Bible predicted that they would want to achieve this. Um, it, it's about the new world order. That's what it's about. Uh, Russia can say what they want to say. The EU can say what they want to say. China can say what they want to say. The US, everybody can say what they want, but they all have their re reasons to legitimize doing what they're doing. And that's all you need. You, you just need some moral cause to excuse or legitimize, you know, why we're invading Ukraine, right? Um, so one of the reasons that they, uh, you know, are doing this is to continue to lower the United States' power globally but not just to lower it, but to create another power that is over the United States. Um, and one of the ways they do that is by weakening their financial power that America has wielded since the Second World War with the dollar. Um, so they've been aiming at trying to figure out how to get rid of the dollar off the reserve currency. What's the reserve currency? It's the, um, it, it's, it's the um, currency that is used to trade oil. And so almost every nation has used the dollar since the Second World War to trade in energy and oil. Um, show, the, show the next slide. So right now, uh, for the reserve currency, foreign exchange reserves, 
uh, the, the US dollar holds about 62% of everything that's traded globally. The euro ha is second with 20%. Now, for years, Russia has been talking about this, Iran's been talking about this, uh, China's been talking about this, and there's a lot of chatter about China, 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 and how China's gonna be, uh, its currency is gonna be the reserve currency. The, the, is it yuan or yuan or something like that? Um, it can't be because the Chinese yuan is only 1.2%. So if the dollar's removed somehow, the, the, the yuan can't be the reserve currency. The next in line is the euro with 20%. But as you're watching what Russia has done, which looked like economic suicide to do what they're doing. So we've included all kinds of restraints on them, the euros, you know, all kinds of restraints on the economic sanctions and everything. So what did they do? They went and signed a big deal with China to supply gas and oil to them. What else did they do? They signed a big deal with India to supply all kinds of gas and oil to them. We say, okay, well, that's no big deal. Well, yeah, you have, you know, probably a third of the planet. You have more people in India than China in a smaller landmass. So you have a few billion people now that need energy. Only what's happened? Russia says, I don't want you to pay in dollars. So what's that going to do? That's going to make this piece of pie much smaller, isn't it? That's the name of the game. Now, obviously, you don't see, root, is ruble on there? Well, that doesn't matter. It's not about rubles. It's about lowering America's financial power and might around the world. Um, so the deal with India, the deal with China, and on top of that, there was this headline that showed China was in Saudi Arabia, and China was talking to Saudi Arabia about a deal to say, could we have some security guarantees in the region from China? China says, yeah, sure. As long as we can buy oil from you in the yuan and not dollars. What's that do? It, okay, maybe that'll increase the yuan a little bit. That's not what it's about. It's about shrinking this pie even more. And why would Saudi Arabia want <laughs> China to pro provide security? because we have an administration in America that's gonna make a deal with a madman in Iran. So of course Saudi Arabia is not getting any security guarantees from America anymore. I mean, if Trump was there, for sure. But they're just about ready to do this insane thing and sign this Iranian deal again and give them loads of money so they can have nukes. So uh, of course, you know, again, God's, you know, allowing all this to happen so that he can come again. Uh, but that's, that's, why, that's one of the reasons why this is happening. Now, whenever we talk about this and uh, you know, America kind of decreasing and other countries coming up, everybody asks, well, you know, where's America in Bible prophecy? Yeah. Have you ever, ever wondered that? It's a common question, everybody asks that. Um, sometimes people look at Revelation 11 and it says there in Revelation 11 that uh, Israel, when the Antichrist comes after him, they hide in the wilderness, but, but they'll go on eagle's wings. Oh, that must be America. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not, not necessarily. Biblical imagery is, is referring back to the Old Testament, how God saves them. It's, it's a supernatural thing. Um, uh, some people, if you look at verse 13 of Ezekiel 38, uh, it says, Sheba and Dedan, that's Saudi Arabia, and the merchants of Tarshish, we believe that Spain could be Great Britain. We're not sure. So if you, if you watch pastors or prophecy gurus on YouTube say, that's Spain and Great Britain. No, we're, 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 we're kinda sh we kind of know that. We're not sure. We're guessing. But it says, and all their young lions. And that's another passage where people say, oh, that must be America because the young lion of Great Britain is America. No, we, I don't think we could be so adamant. You can't, you can't say that for sure. It's kind of a stretch, okay? So when you hear that stuff, just kind of check that at the door. We just don't know. 
If it's, if it's close to Sheba and Dedan and merchants with them, uh, then young lions, it, it, it could just as you know, very well be that that deal that Israel signed with some of the, the smaller satellite Arabian states through Trump. You know, United Arab Emirates, those, those nations there, it could be that. But I, you can't say that that's America, okay? Um, so, you know, as much as we have been a superpower today, it really is hard to believe that we'll be irrelevant at some of the most crucial time in all of human history, but it, it's possible we're irrelevant. Uh, one of the ways a nation becomes irrelevant is when they get into debt. We have a little debt. <laughs> Just a little, you know. I think I read today, uh, first time in, in American history, our trade deficit is $109 billion. First time over $100 billion. You know, the national debt is what? Almost 30 trillion. Um, but I think beyond that, just international political and military will with, with the current administration, we lack willpower. We have good men and women that are in the military. We have capable captains and we have capable um, you know, soldiers, but if command and control lacks the willpower to go fight or do anything, then they'll just sit there. So I, I think, yeah, I kind of see where we're at right now. Yes, we, we really do, um, it's looking like we're, we're gonna be irrelevant. Um, now, there's lots of other nations that aren't mentioned in Bible prophecy. You've heard me say that before. You never hear about Mexico, do you? Or Guatemala, or uh, Italy necessarily. I mean, you don't hear, hear about these nations. Ireland, Scotland, you don't hear about it. Canada, right? Uh, so uh, that could be another reason. Uh, look at this next slide. This is called the, the Teitler cycle. Alexander Teitler was a Scotsman about the time of our nation uh, being birthed. And he said this, that every democratic society in history has about a 200 year lifespan. Where are we at? We're over 200 years, right? It's just a cycle of the nation. And, and it, he says, everyone, you can track it through history, they start right here in bondage, and then they have you know, some kind of spiritual faith you know, that puts them together. And then they have courage and then they have liberty, and then they have abundance, and then they have selfishness, complacency, apathy, dependence. So where do you think we are in this? Over here? Right here, we're right here, right? No, no right here? No, no, right over here? So it's interesting, isn't it? Now, you know, again, who knows? I mean, we've had great awakenings before. There have been times in America when the tide was way out spiritually. I mean, churches were empty. Uh, Christians had to hide on campuses at Harvard and Yale. These were Christian schools at the time. They got so bad. Alcoholism, um, you know, sexual promiscuity, just horrible. And then all of a sudden, people got desperate enough and they start calling on God. Lord, we, can't, we need help. We need help from you. And then he comes in as a lifesaver. And then there's a, a revival, like I was saying, through repentance and contrition. And then he revives the nation again. So we've had these great awakenings. Who knows? You know, this thing at the Supreme Court? Maybe, maybe God would grant us, you know, some more years. Maybe God would breathe on us and give us life again to the degree that we're faithful to Israel, that, that certainly goes in our favor as well. If you bless Israel, I'll bless you. That may be the only thing that's holding us together here right now. But, but this thing at the Supreme Court is phenomenal, remarkable. Uh, I probably won't change New York per se. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't change what we do. We still are gonna save one life at a time, aren't we? That's what we do. Uh, but it is interesting that, uh, how, that, how that circle goes. Um, so if America is, is waning, um, 
This, this I believe, is what's really important. Next slide. Uh, the rise of the European superpower. And I'll show you why um, uh, in a minute here. Uh, turn over to Daniel chapter two. <coughs> Excuse me. Daniel chapter two. Forty-two. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. It's one of the most far-reaching prophecies in all of the Bible. Um, Daniel gets the interpretation, and you know it's that dream of that statue with the gold head, and then the silver arms, uh, right, the bronze, and then um, <clears throat> the iron legs, and then the feet and the toes, those ten toes that are mixed with iron and clay. Remember that? Uh, so obviously, as you go through the, the scriptures, you obviously realize that the iron, no doubt, has to be Rome. It's successive. It comes after Greece, comes after Persia, Medo-Persia, and then you have Rome. Those are the iron legs. So when you get down to the toes and you see something in verse 42 where it says, as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly of clay then it lets us know that there's some substance of Rome in them because there's iron. And so Bible scholars have believed for the longest time what that means is there's going to come a revived Roman Empire which predominantly lives in Europe. Um, so the, the, the revived Roman Empire, we see from 242 these 10 toes that are still yet to come in the future here. Turn over to Daniel 9 verse 26. Daniel gets a prophecy here. Well, actually, he's told by the angel concerning Israel that Messiah would come and Messiah, Jesus, would be cut off, if you will, and we know he was crucified. Uh, but look at verse 26. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So remember, after Jesus was cut off, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, right? And who was it destroyed by? It was destroyed by the Romans. But here, Daniel is told by the angel, the people of the prince who is to come. That's speaking of the Antichrist. And who is he from? The people who destroyed the temple the revived Romans, the revived Roman Empire. So that's how we understand that somehow the Antichrist will come out of this revived Roman emperor. Now, you watch the news today and people are starting to notice this. They're starting to pay attention how Europe is starting to assert themselves to be the leader as America declines. And, and they'll talk about things like this because everything's about China right now, right? And so, so the newscasters say, well, you know, we may be moving from bipolar to tripolar. You know, not just the U.S. and China, but now we're seeing China, the U.S., and the European Union. What does the Bible say? The Bible says it's unipolar. <laughs> it's going to be the European Union. It's going to be the revived Roman Empire. America's going to be irrelevant. China pretty much irrelevant. By the way, they're, they're in a horrible national, their national debt is horrible. They have an economic collapse, you know, just right on the brink. They're trying to hold on. Uh, next slide. So what's a superpower? Uh, it's a country with the ability to project its dominance and influence anywhere in the world. And when we talk about dominance, we talk about two spheres of dominance, financial and military. Um, so that... That's what's happening now with uh, the European Union. Next slide. Um, I, I had bar graphs here, but they didn't show up in the slide here. But this is, if, if you combine the 27 nations of the European Union together, 
look at where they stand as far as economic power. USA at $22 trillion GDP, China has 18 trillion GDP, and the EU together is right behind China and growing. Um, something happened in March that was one of these accelerants, if you will, or leaps forward in this whole process. Um, it was, as they call it, a defining moment, and it was the birth of the European military or European defense. And uh, if you look at some of their you know, discussions and their conferences, they keep saying, because of the current crisis, we must do this. We have to do this. And I'll tell you what, if, if you check it out on, on the internet, it is a little eerie to see Germans uh, with a certain type of mustache and haircuts talking in that dialect, you know, in sort of an angry tone. Uh, it's, it's a little eerie because it isn't so long ago that we saw that very thing in the 1940s. Uh, but they, we have to do this. Um, but in March, NATO Secretary um, Jan Stoltenberg, he had a major press conference and he announced to everybody, he said, he said right to Russia, he says, Putin, you cannot win a nuclear exchange. You will not win. And then he had a direct threat and a challenge to China. We don't like what you're doing, what you're doing you're gonna to have to pick a different side. I mean, it was, it was fairly confrontational. He then went on to say, we already have 100,000 US troops right here in Europe. We have five carrier groups of the allies in either the North Atlantic or the Mediterranean. Now, a carrier group has aircraft carriers, it has destroyers, it has submarines, it's full combat, five carrier groups all around. Um, and they are, in, in March, they launched this gigantic arms spending spree. Um, next slide. So this, these are their graphics, by the way. This is European Union graphics. So they have put this out, the Joint Defense Agreement. Um, it's not so much NATO per se, it's European Union. So an attack on one is an attack on all of them. Um, uh, next, next slide. So again, if you look at the number of troops for countries, because China and India have the greatest population, obviously, you know, it's a pretty big number. India has a pretty big number. The U.S. has a pretty big number. Um, but the European Union, 1.3 million, it's up there. They have a lot of people that they can put to this. So, I think right now, if there's one big thing to pay attention to, start to pay attention to the rise of the European Union uh, as a superpower, as they start to flex their muscles and they start to dictate uh, how these things are gonna happen. Personally, I kind of believe that the current administration in America is happy to have it so. I do, I, I kind of think they, they believe in this new world order and so they're just gonna bow out and kind of let this thing happen. Uh, by the way, in, <laughs> this is so funny. In the European Union's own propaganda about this, when they say, we must do this, they show a little clip of Trump. And Trump is there years ago, he's saying, he goes, he goes you know why the European Union is there? You know why NATO is there? To take money from us. We can't let this happen. And then the commentator for the European Union says, do we want to go back to that? <laughs> He says, no, we can't have that. So they're basically saying, we're gonna take charge. That's what they wanna do. So that's, that's one area. The other area that I think you should pay attention to is the mass collection of biometric data. And when I say biometric data, I mean either your DNA or your, your face, your image, uh, or your retina scan. Um, by the way, di digital ID was already in process because of the COVID pass, remember that? Um, and if you live in China, China records almost everything a person does. They have cameras everywhere and they monitor every single financial transaction because they have a social credit score. So if, if, you, if you buy the wrong thing, you get thumped, you can't travel. 
If you buy the wrong book or if you go to church, that counts against you because you're not with a communist party. Uh, Hong Kong, I saw today Hong Kong, somebody got so sick of these facial recognition cameras that are everywhere, they took a sawzall and cut one down. Uh, but, but they have all kinds of facial recognition uh, cameras. Uh, but in Europe now, they're really, especially in Sweden, in the Scandinavian countries, they're really getting into these chip implants and they're getting into buying by scanning uh, your hand. Uh, turn to Revelation 13. Somebody called cross-section yesterday and <clears throat> we got talking about this, about the false prophet. But in verse 16, it's the false prophet that causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now everybody talks about, well, is the, is the mark of the beast here? Right? No, mark of the beast isn't here. This chip implant isn't the mark of the beast. But you can see how people are being conditioned to head in that direction. Um, but, but I will say this, it won't be against people's will. It, it, people will line up for it. And that's what we're seeing today. In Sweden, 6,000 people uh, have agreed that yes, take my biometric data, put the chip in me, I want to do it. This is convenience, you know. And so I can just buy or sell and they actually have CO2 limits on their credit accounts. So for instance, say, say Todd, Todd likes to cut trees like I do. And say he goes and he wants to cut a lot of trees, but he's got a wood splitter that he's gonna loan to me and he has a chainsaw, and so he's always buying gas to fill up those gas cans. Well, he has a CO2 limit. You can't buy gas, we're gonna go to complete you know, windmills and electric, right? So he only has so much credit limit for CO2 stuff, and so they'll put a limit on it. No, you can't, you can't buy gas anymore. Well, that's happening already in Europe. Isn't that interesting? Uh, it, I, so it wouldn't be surprised if they start to do that here. But on top of that, if they could get cash out of people's hands and they could make it digital, then they can start to implement more controls on people. So every, every, has anybody heard of cryptocurrency? Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, that's not the thing to worry about because that's really unregulated. What to worry about is the central bank digital currency. When the central banks are nationalized and they create one or the feds create one, well then they have laws around it to control how that's used. Those are the things to pay attention to and more and more central banks are getting in bed with Visa, MasterCard to implement this. In fact, I, I, I saw a panel discussion, I mean here it is, Ukrainians are being bombed and the World Economic Forum is, is having this, this talk and they're almost giddy about the opportunity now to go to see you know, CBDCs. And then they have to stop themselves and they say, oh, oh, oh of course, we, we have to make sure uh, that people have personal safeguards. You know, it's almost like they had to catch themselves. You know. um, we, uh, yeah, what they said was, of course we have to put in place consumer protection. Um, but look at this, next slide. A company called WorldCoin, um, now valued at $1 billion, has grand plans to get you to gaze into the orb. Um, I read another article, There's, they've done 130,000 people. They have scanned their faces and their eyes and, and they go into poor countries. They've gone into Indonesia um, and like poor countries and they've offered them money. Look, we'll give you a lot of money if you let us collect your face and scan your retina and keep that data. And how much is a lot of money, do you think? For them? $25. I read another article where 500,000 people did it. Uh, next slide. Here's the orb. So you bring that kind of fascinating technology into third world or fifth world countries for $25? That'll go a long way. Uh, and, and they do it. Uh, and they are, in the article it says they're betting billions will line up to do it. 
So poor nations are doing it. And right now, uh, production stands at 4,000 orbs a month that they're producing. Um, they're working on getting orb operations around the world. And uh, make no mistake, um, you know, Silicon Valley has all kinds of companies that are gearing up to compete uh, to be on the leading edge of this. Um, so the United Nations is collecting uh, biometric data of Ukrainian refugees today. Why? You know, why are we doing that? Uh, but I think this is another thing that kind of heads into this totalitarian control of people to collect information. So the rise of the EU, the rise of biometric data, uh, that, that's something uh, to pay attention to. Um, I do want to say one more thing here. The war in Ukraine and Russia, obviously people have said, you know, that's the breadbasket of the world. That's where over 25% of the wheat comes from. Um, that's where a lot of precious metals come from uh, for our computer, you know, computers and things like that. Uh, and so there's a lot of people who are talking about coming massive shortages in our stores, um, in our grocery stores and things like that. And to be honest, I, I, I've heard of pastors, I've seen pastors talk about this thing and almost create more fear in people. And it really bothers me. I don't know if you've seen that stuff online. And so what they're doing is they're telling people, you need to prepare, you need to know this is coming right now. And, and I just wanna say, it kind of reminds me of Y2K. Because at Y2K, a lot of pastors were saying that and they were terrifying the body and people were going out and they, and they were turning into preppers. And they were buying all kinds of things, buying all kinds of things because it's the end of the world, you know, and planes are gonna come out of the sky and, and they were really, I mean, to me, it, it, was, it was bad what these guys were doing to people. They're making disciples, but they're making the wrong kind of disciples. You know, I'm not telling you to go out and prepare. Quite honestly, you can't prepare enough <laughs> if that happens. Save for a rainy day, absolutely. Save for, you know, a week or two or something like that, or, you know, you can. But if something like that happens for a prolonged time and everything is hit and, you know, no, you can't prepare for that. And I don't think it's right for a shepherd to scare people. I think it's, I think it's right for, for a shepherd to point them in the right direction so they can handle it. And every time in human history, no matter what it is, I mean, this is what this Bible is all about. No matter where the people of God has been, God has always been there for them to help them through. I don't know how he's gonna do it, but he does it. So, so the best thing that I can do for you and tell you is don't listen to those guys that are scaring you out there and you're turning into a hoarder. I mean, I, I know some people at Y2K, quite honestly, they were thinking, man, this is our food and everybody comes to my door. These are Christians. <laughs> are you kidding me? That's nonsense. The best thing that you can do to prepare is to develop your relationship with Jesus Christ, is to know Jesus. Let him fill your heart and your mind with absolute trust and confidence in him, that he's Jehovah Jireh. That's what you need to do. I'm not saying don't save up, I'm not saying don't get some things to prepare for something, but honestly, you can't prepare for the end of the world. <laughs> you just can't. And it would just drive you crazy, and it will make you lose sleep, or it will make you go talk to a counselor or something, or take medication or something. That's not the peace of God. That's not it at all. Um, so, I mean, this Bible is filled with, uh, you know, people who've been in a desperate situation and somehow, some way, God came in and helped. Um, so I, I, I think the best thing that you and I can do is deepen our relationship with Jesus and know him. Okay? Any questions? Do we have questions tonight? No math questions. Anything at all that you've seen on the news or whatever? <coughs> yeah. Can you explain the, the or biometric stuff a little bit more? What's happening with that? Because I really don't understand. 
Yeah, well, you can find the article on Coindesk. Uh, can you put the, the last slide? Um, yeah, it doesn't really show up. It, it, it's at Coindesk, and, and all you do is do a search for Orb. But it, it's, it's the thing where, you know, information now is worth a lot of money. And so we're, we're in this information age, and all these companies, Google, Apple, uh, you know, Twitter, Amazon, they're all after it, somehow, some way. And so these companies, they're jumping on, and so this orb comes along, and if they can collect information on people, then they can take the next step and move into this whole digitally controlled era. Um, so. Okay, prophetically, yeah. Well, we know in the last days from Revelation 13 that the Antichrist and that last superpower, he is a, he's a totalitarian. He wants to dominate everybody. He wants to dictate everybody. And nobody will be able to buy or sell without some sort of an identification mark. So it controls people. And so what we're hearing with the central banks and digital currency, how they can control transactions uh, for instance, that CO2 limit, they can sort of dictate what's happening in China, that's what they're doing. They know where everybody is, they know where they live, they know what they buy, they know what they think, they know what they like, and they try to shape it so that they can all agree, you know, kumbaya, let's all come together to be the world, you know. So that's, that's what's gonna happen with the Antichrist, all right? So, yeah, no, they, don't, they don't really like any kind of cash transactions under the table that they don't know about. So, yeah, it's a good question, real good question. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, Dario. You said that the people are, are getting, they're gazing into the orb for money. Well, they offer $25 to these people, and people are just lining up. To them, it's a lot of money. But I think they're taking advantage. I think they're exploiting people. That's what they're doing. They're exploiting people. But it just shows you how people, I mean, look, younger people, look what people, Instagram was a step in the, Facebook was a step in the direction. Instagram was another step in the direction. TikTok was a whole other step in the direction. People put their whole lives out there. I want people to know me. I want people to know my whole life. That's all been collected, that's all been given to a company. So younger people, quite honestly, are already conditioned to this kind of thing. What's the big deal? Yeah, 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 I mean, that's ultimately people want that. People want security, just take care of me, and uh, people do a lot for that. You know, if, if their help is not in the Lord, then they look to man or they look to government to do that. But our, our country's kind of gotten off any kind of socialistic, you know, for a long time. And it's not just in government, it's in our universities too. Um, so, but yeah, people, people will do a lot for security. People do a lot for money, you know, give up a lot. Yeah, Jeff. Why is there this dynamic between Europe and all the troublemakers coming out of there, like with Rome and Germany, World War I, World War II, and then Russia? Why? Because it seems like if there's demons involved, they would all be working together, but there seems to be this weird dichotomy going on. Russia's going to go east to south. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, honestly, I think you, you touched on something. Um, I think it was several weeks ago, um, we kind of looked at Daniel, where Daniel, you know, in Daniel chapter nine, he's praying. He's like, okay, we're at the end of 70 years, and he's, he's talking to the Lord. And then the angel comes to him, and he says, you know what, I would have come here, however, I was in a little battle, and the prince of Persia, or prince of Greece, you know, obstructed me, I had, I had to, 
I had to knock him out. No, <laughs> I had to fight him off. I would have been here sooner, uh, but I was delayed three weeks because of that. And so we do understand that there is supernatural demonic powers behind major geographical areas or cities, and you know, even possibly Albany or Washington, D.C., right? So it is interesting that Germany's coming up again because when you watch the films of some of these Germans, it really looks eerie. It looks like it's the same kind of influence. Um, you know, and again, they, since the Second World War, they've had a pacifist kind of mindset. Look, we're not going there. Th there's a huge liberal, um, I would say, um, population, populace in Germany uh, that is worried about neo-Nazism, right? Uh, Japan, for the most part, has been pacifist. It's, it's kind of putting in their constitution post-Second World War. We don't want to do that. Well, now all of a sudden, there are Russian ships and Chinese ships that are encircling Japan, and now there's this new move in Japan to say, hey, you know what, we got to do something. So, but yeah, I think you're onto something. There's something in Germany there. Um, but, you know, the Lord said that the Antichrist is going to come out of that whole, you know, affiliation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Bob. Well, I would say this, you know, the, f the first point in contact, they see what you see. And I think the first thing you could do is, yeah, man, this is crazy, but the Bible predicted it would happen. I think that's the first thing, you know, point to the word. And, um, and I think the next thing is to let them know all that stuff that, that's being promised is a false hope. You know, you have the real hope. That's what I would do. I would, I would point to that, point to the script. This has been predicted. You're not surprised. Uh, and here's why. And then I would, I would get them to the Lord. That's what I would do. Now, you and I, you know, we're, quite honestly, we're, we're looking for the rapture, right? The Lord's going to come. And that, you know, Gog Magog, that's after the rapture. You know, I don't think we should obsess about it like a lot of Christians are. Um, you know, again, you know, we got to develop our own relationship with Jesus, get close to Jesus. I think the best thing is we pull closer together as brothers and sisters. Um, so I think that, that's important. And I've, I've heard this, you know, right now it just seems weird within Christianity because there's a lot of Christians say, ah, you know, what did, you, you, know you, you shouldn't be telling people about pre-trib rapture, you know, that's a false hope, you're a false prophet and all of that. You're, you're not preparing people. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I mean, how are you preparing people? <laughs> You know, you can't prepare people for the tribulation. What are you doing? They're not doing anything. So it's not a false hope. It's what the Bible teaches. In fact, turn to, turn to Revelation 3. Verse 10. Jesus writes to the church at Philadelphia, which is the, which is the true church, <clears throat> down through the ages, through any problem whatsoever, through any problem in human history. And he says, because you have kept my command to persevere. Well, that's a good word for us, don't you agree? That's the word, persevere. You gotta keep at it. Don't give up, don't quit. Right now, the enemy, it's, it's an all out assault to get Christians to quit. Quit serving him, to quit loving, to quit forgiving, quit being kind, quit being light. Don't quit. Persevere. And I, will, I also will keep you, look at this, from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. He doesn't say I'll keep you from trials. He says I'll keep you from the hour, of the time of trial. The, the one time of trial that occurs on the whole world, which is what? John knows it's the tribulation. So here, here's the church. True believers will be kept from that time period, that, those seven years. So I'll keep you from that time. Which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. Hold fast, that's, 
That's that Dutch term, hold tight. Uh, sometimes Paul would use that, hold fast to the gospel, hold fast to what is good. So he says, hold fast, persevere what you have that no one may take your crown. So that's the, that's the word to the church. He's gonna keep us from it. Does it mean things won't get, get bad? Things probably get bad, okay? But it's not gonna be the tribulation. It won't be the wrath of God, you know? When, when the wrath of God is poured out, it will be unmistakable. Revelation 6 tells us that. It will be unmistakable and people will say, man, somebody help us from the wrath of the lamb. It'll be unmistakable. But he's not gonna do that to his bride. You know, the wrath for your sin was already taken care of, right? Just logically, Jesus says, it is finished. The payment for your sin has been paid in full. So of course, no Christian gets double indemnity. <laughs> There's no way he would do that to his bride in the tribulation because Jesus already paid that penalty. Otherwise, what's the point? Why did he go to the cross? So that should give you assurance and confidence. So, any other question? Yes. Do we have any way of knowing how far along this is going to get before Christ comes back? We don't have any way of knowing how far Don't have, no, we don't have any idea. And again, you know, who, who knows? It could be one step forward, two steps back. Two steps forward, one step back. You know, I, 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 it just, you can't tell, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we're in a stage setting, you know, time frame right now. Um, I, do, I do see the rise of, of the EU, you know, that's, they're probably gonna continue to head in that direction, you know. Um, more and more control over people, I think that's gonna continue to trend, you know. Um, but would I love to see just, a, like I said, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know, where we just have massive amounts of Jesus freaks again. <laughs> we have a Jesus movement. That'd be wonderful, you know. Personally, this is my own opinion. Personally, I think that's just like Jesus. You know, just before it gets bad, he comes in and he casts a big wide net and saves a bunch of people. <laughs> that's what I like to see. Exactly. Th that's what we should do. Because all the prophecies had been fulfilled at that time. Yeah, there's no prophecy for the rapture. There's no prophecy for that. So there's no precondition. Uh, well, I, I would say there is one condition, but we don't know when it happens. It, it, it's when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. In other words, when, when the church is done, he's building his church. So when he's finished building his church, well, then he's going to come for his church. So whoever that last Gentile, you get busy, will you? So <laughs> okay, because we're waiting, you know. <laughs> yeah, Al. I can't hear you. I don't have my hearing aids in. Well, talking about the rapture, I think is, uh, and, and talking about the Lord's coming, for sure, and talking about how you guys are saved from it, absolutely. Um, the Church of Philadelphia is, is a key indicator. Um, ta talking about you know, this great symbol of his love for us, uh, that's why we're here. Um, uh, the rest of the world, quite honestly, th th obviously they don't, don't have hope. They're gonna look to people. They're gonna look to government solutions, because that's all they have. But our hope is far higher and much more sure. Um, and so that's why I'm telling you the best thing that we can do is let's just get to know Jesus more. Um, that's why I do these things rare. I don't do them very often because uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the best, um, best way to spend our time necessarily. But I do think there's a couple of things that we need to pay attention to and I think the, the rise of the EU is, is very significant for sure. Um, so that's what this whole Ukraine-Russia thing is all about. Okay, it, it's about change the world order and uh, you know, we're gonna solve the world's problems this way, that's, a, that's what this is about. So, any other question? Yeah, Todd. If I let you borrow my sweater, <laughs> 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 I get my fuel limit in July, does that mean you have to mow my lawn? 
It, it does, it does, but I'm going to need to use your electric mower. <laughs> now, I mean, think about it. I mean, Americans are consumers. You know, we consume gas. I mean, I, I just don't know how that would wash with us. You know, I mean, just, I just try, try to, I mean, I know some, this is New York, you know, but if I go somewhere down there in Kentucky and Tennessee and some of those big giant monster trucks that are in driveways, I, I don't know, you know. Um, you know, if, if, they, if they tried to disarm us, you know, uh, that, that'd be kind of a scary thing. <laughs> but it's not in the Bible, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? No? Okay, that's good. All right, where's your team? You guys want to come up? Let's let's turn. Ushers, can you come up here? Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I'm glad we got to Revelation three, because I, I really, I really wanted to read that because it, it's to us, and and I like that word, hold fast and persevere. Um, it's so important for us to hold fast to Jesus Christ and know that He's holding fast to you and I. Um, I think, it's, I think it's great that the Holy Spirit has let us know these things ahead of time so that we can put it in perspective, you know, and we don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to think, well, you know, everything's out of control. Uh, the pieces actually are coming all together. That's what you can know. Um, the pace, who knows, you know. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for the flock tonight and their interests and their desire. You, you see the hearts here. Um, Lord, we, we've, we've gone to scripture tonight. We've gone to Daniel and we've gone to Ezekiel. We've gone to Revelation. Uh, you, you have been so good to let us know ahead of time. And it just, it reminds us how you love us. Uh, Father, we pray that your kingdom would come. We pray that you would, uh, as, uh, as Revelation says there, that you come quickly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.